on World News Tonight. Total victory. The Taliban raises their flag and is now claiming total control of Afghanistan. Storm threat. Millions still reeling from Storm Ida and flash flood watchers are up in Louisiana. New threat. India is facing the trauma of another healthcare crisis while preparing for the third COVID wave. Surf's up. Healthcare workers experience a new kind of wave to get rid of their stress. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is Ada Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with the last holdout in Afghanistan. A week since the U.S. military withdrew from Afghanistan, the Taliban has claimed victory over opposition forces in Pangshir province, stressing they've now secured control of the entire country. The Taliban says its new government will be announced very soon. The Taliban says it has taken full control of Panjshir province just north of Kabul, which was the last area in Afghanistan held by resistance forces. The announcement came exactly a week after the complete withdrawal of the U.S. military from Afghanistan and some three weeks after they captured Kabul. The group's spokesman claimed the Taliban no longer wants war. The anti-Taliban National Resistance Front, however, is vowing to carry on fighting, saying its struggle against the Taliban is not over. The whereabouts of the front's leader was not immediately clear. Saying there were no civilian casualties in the process of seizing Panjshir, the Taliban also said food will arrive and electricity will soon be reactivated in the region. Holding the Panjshir Valley is a major symbolic victory for the Taliban, as it was never able to control it when the group last ruled the country. The Taliban also insisted the new government will be announced very soon, downplaying rumors about internal disputes. While the Taliban was expected to make the announcement late last week, it was delayed with no new date set. The group has reportedly invited a number of countries, China, Pakistan, Russia and Qatar, for the inauguration ceremony of the new government. The colonel behind a push in Guinea promised investors that business deals would not be affected by the country's latest coup and vowed to form a government of national union to oversee a political transition. A degree of normality returned to the streets of Guinea's capital, Conakry, on Monday, the day after a military unit ousted President Alpha Conde. Traffic resumed, albeit through military checkpoints, and some shops reopened around the main administrative district of Kaloum. The area on Sunday witnessed heavy gunfire as the special forces troops battled soldiers loyal to the president. But having seized control, the elite unit now faces the task of maintaining it. <laughs> Colonel Mamadi Dumbuya, the leader of the unit that removed Conde, gathered government officials together on Monday. They've been barred from leaving the country until further notice. Dumbuya also instructed them to hand back their official vehicles, though he added that there would be no witch hunt. The frontier aerial. Air borders have been reopened, the soldiers have said, and a curfew in mining areas lifted. Guinea has the world's largest reserves of bauxite, an ore used in the production of aluminum. Aluminum prices soared on Monday to a 10-year high over fears of supply disruption. The apparent coup has also been met with condemnation from some of Guinea's strongest allies. The United Nations quickly denounced the takeover and both the African Union and West Africa's regional bloc, ECOWAS, have threatened sanctions. But on the streets of Conakry, some, like Abdullahi Bangura, described Dumbuya's arrival as a blessing. Dumbuya told state television that poverty and endemic corruption had driven his forces to oust Conde. But uncertainty remains. While the military unit appears to have Conde in detention, other branches of the army are yet to publicly comment. Over in the United States, half a million are still without power after Hurricane Ida tore through Louisiana, destroying homes and power lines. The state attorney general is demanding answers after hundreds of nurse home residents were moved to a warehouse and left on cots in flood waters. Over the weekend, another 600 residents were evacuated from eight senior centers after they were deemed unfit for ongoing occupancy.
eight days after Ida, half a million in Louisiana are still without power. Some communities surrounded by standing water, homes gone. Officials say the total number of destroyed power poles higher than Hurricanes Katrina, Ike, Delta, and Zeta combined. The National Guard now operating a floating bridge to one town completely cut off by floodwaters. Concerns also rising about the most vulnerable. No lights, no water, no hot water, no hot meals or nothing. Over the weekend, 600 residents evacuated from eight senior centers after the health department deemed them unfit for ongoing occupancy. The city says five are dead. What we found was unacceptable. Really Meanwhile, seven now dead and the state attorney general demanding answers after more than 800 nursing home residents were evacuated oh. to this warehouse and left on cots in floodwaters. But also small miracles. Chained up and trapped under debris, animal rescuers found this pup, Bubbles, who survived for four days, like many here, looking for a new home. In recent developments of the abortion ban in Texas, the Justice Department of the United States has declared that no attacks against the abortion clinics or people interested in the option of abortion will be tolerated by the country. The U.S. Justice Department on Monday said it would not tolerate attacks against people seeking or providing abortions in Texas, as the agency explores ways of challenging the state's recently enacted law that imposed a near-total ban on abortion. The law, known as SB8, leaves enforcement up to individual citizens, enabling them to sue anyone who provides or aids and abets an abortion after about six weeks of pregnancy. U.S. Attorney General Merrick Garland said in a statement the department would protect those seeking to obtain or provide reproductive health services through a 1994 law known as the Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act, or FACE Act. The FACE Act prohibits the use of force and physical obstruction to interfere with a person obtaining or providing reproductive health services. In the statement, Garland said, quote, The department will provide support from federal law enforcement when an abortion clinic or reproductive health center is under attack, adding that he would not tolerate violence against those seeking to obtain or provide reproductive health services. Garland said the Justice Department would enforce the FACE Act while it, quote, urgently explores all options to challenge Texas SB 8 in order to protect the constitutional rights of women and other persons. Texas Governor Greg Abbott's office did not immediately respond to a request for comment. A court in Belarus sentenced one of the country's most prominent opposition figures, Maria Kalensikova, to 11 years in prison after the led unprecedented protest against President Alexander Lukashenko last year. Maria Kolesnikova, who led mass street protests against Belarusian President Alexander Lukashenko last year, was sentenced to 11 years in jail on Monday. The 39-year-old was detained after ripping up her passport, an attempt to stop Belarusian security forces from deporting her in a standoff at the Ukrainian border in September. She and another senior opposition figure, Maxim Znak, were charged with extremism and trying to seize power illegally. They both deny wrongdoing, with Kolesnikova calling the charges absurd. Znak was sentenced to 10 years in prison. The pair were held in glass cages ahead of the verdict. Kolesnikova raised her handcuffed hands to make her trademark heart sign and smiled for the cameras. The musician turned politician became one of the faces of a large opposition movement during the country's presidential election in August 2020. Protesters claim the vote was rigged in an effort to prolong Lukashenko's grip on power. She is one of three women, all political novices, who joined forces to front the election campaign against him after higher profile male candidates were barred from standing. Lukashenko, who vehemently denies electoral fraud, has been in office since 1994. He has faced fresh Western sanctions in recent months after launching a violent crackdown on his opponents. The trial, which began last month, was closed to the public on national security grounds. The European Union denounced the verdict, while Britain's foreign minister called it an assault on defenders of democracy. The circumstances of the case, the investigators and the witnesses have not been disclosed. The latest on the COVID crisis right after this break, you're watching World News.
Welcome back. India is facing another crisis as the nation is preparing for the third outbreak of COVID-19. Dengue fever is now on the rise and for further details, we cross over to Adhidharana World News Pressure Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekar who joins us now from Delhi in India. Gayatri? Yes, Shanali. Dengue fever has gripped several districts of India's most populous Uttar Pradesh state as the death toll breached 100. Firsabad district, which was the first one to report the outbreak, has added additional beds in hospital corridors and under construction buildings to accommodate the rising number of dengue patients. The district reported a total of 51 deaths by dengue this season, raising alarm about the virus fever, mostly affecting the children. In other districts like Prayagraj and Agra, the rise in dengue cases has concerned the local authorities, prompting them to switch to action with deploying mosquito nets and uh, taking stock of preparations. Meanwhile, in Krasholi village of Kanpur district in the state has villagers vacating homes out of virus fever, uh, fears. The village has reported 200 cases of viral fever and 18 dengue patients. According to locals, at least 15 families have left the village because of the virus. On the other hand, the Dao market of India's financial capital Mumbai witnessed a massive uh, crowd of shoppers amid concerns of a potential third wave of coronavirus ahead of festival season. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent Gayatri Gunasekara reporting from Delhi in India. Millions of Americans are on the move as the CDC warns unvaccinated Americans to stay home. Health experts fear the holiday weekend could be another super spreader, just as kids are returning to the classroom. Tonight, millions of Americans are flocking to vacation hotspots this holiday weekend. Despite a CDC warning, the unvaccinated should stay close to home. If people aren't vaccinated, they shouldn't travel. The TSA reporting 5.3 million passengers crossing airport security since Friday, more than double the number seen at this point during Labor Day weekend last year. I'm going to Disney World. The COVID numbers in Florida scare me, but I'm vaccinated. Many making their way to stadiums, music festivals, and beaches across the country. Yet the spread of the virus rages on. The number of reported cases reaching 40 million in the U.S. Now health experts fear the holiday weekend could be another super spreader just as kids are returning to the classroom. With COVID already forcing at least 1,400 in-person school closures since the beginning of this school year, recent data from the American Academy of Pediatrics indicates more than one in five new cases are in children. The only place I'm worried about is my daughter, who's unvaccinated, obviously, since she's four. And with no vaccine available for children 12 and under, parents are doing what they can to protect their kids while keeping them in school. We have some good news for you. Cuban authorities launched a national campaign to vaccinate children aged 2 to 18 against COVID-19, a prerequisite set by the communist government for schools to reopen amid a spike in infections. It's back to school in Cuba, but it won't be in person just yet. Discounting a few weeks here and there, most pupils have not been in a classroom since March 2020. They're due back in October or November, and to speed up that return, the government's launched a campaign to vaccinate children, many of whom are keen to get back to their pre-pandemic lives. 12 to 18-year-olds are being vaccinated first, and then children aged 2 to 11 will be eligible from September 15th, making Cuba the first country to offer the jab to children this young. They'll be administering the local vaccines Abdallah and Soberana, which were approved for emergency use by Cuba's national health regulator. Authorities have not said that getting the shot will be mandatory, but they have confirmed that schools will not open their doors until all students have been vaccinated. The move comes amid a sharp rise of COVID cases in Cuba. Since the beginning of the pandemic, the island has reported more than 670,000 cases of the virus and 5,500 deaths. A month after cruise ships were banned from Venice Lagoon, city authorities are preparing to demand that tourists pre-book their visits on an app. And it's going to be charged day trippers between 3 and 10 euros to enter, depending on the time of the year. 
St Mark's Square and the Rialto Bridge, iconic sites of Venice that attract thousands of tourists every day. From a control room inside the city's police headquarters, they're being watched. To combat over-tourism, officials are tracking every person. Using CCTV, optical sensors and mobile phone SIM cards, they can tell residents from visitors, Italians from foreigners. They know where people are coming from and where they are heading. A month after cruise ships were banned from Venice, city authorities are preparing to ask visitors to pre-book and charge day-trippers between 3 and 10 euros to enter. Authorities have yet to decide how many people is too many. The new rules are expected to come into force between next summer and 2023. Some Venetian businesses worry about the impact on their sales. Tourists appear divided. I know also that there are some inhabitants of Venice who complain because there are too many people visiting the city. But uh, I think that the city lives also thanks to the tourists. So um, maybe there are a little bit too many people sometimes, but they should definitely find another way. I can understand it because the city is very overcrowded and it will probably be a lot nicer for the citizens of Venice. One recent weekend, there were around 148,000 people in the historic centre of Venice. That's before the full return of tourists from the US and Asia. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. China's foreign ministry is likely to visit Seoul next week for talks with South Korean counterpart and they are expected to discuss North Korea issues especially considering reports the North may have restarted its main nuclear reactor using to produce atomic bombs. SpaceX says it will launch an all-civilian group for four into space on September 15th on a mission dubbed Inspiration4. The team tweeted that they've completed preparations and will be ready to lift off from Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The Taliban has painted its flag on a wall outside the U.S. Embassy in Kabul. The radical group's white and black banner, which features an Islamic statement of faith, was painted along a roadway and in front of a security watchtower. El Salvador's government says its historic adoption of Bitcoin as legal tender will save Salvadorans leaving abroad millions of dollars in transfer charges, but some remain unconvinced. More than 42 million old vehicle tires dumped in Kuwait sands have started to be recycled as the Gulf state tackles a waste problem that created one of the world's largest tire graveyards. South Korea's biggest automaker is joining the race to go green. Hyundai will go all electric in Europe from 2035 to bring carbon emissions to net zero in roughly 20 years. Going 100% electric. That seems to be the future path for South Korean auto giant Hyundai Motor Group as part of its efforts to be carbon zero by 2045. One of its major plans is to sell only electric vehicles in Europe starting 2035. And by 2040, the company will stop selling combustion engine vehicles entirely in South Korea, raising the proportion of electric cars by up to 80 percent out of its total global sales. Hyundai unveiled such plans at the International Motor Show, IAA Mobility 2021, where it shared its carbon net zero project, outlining the entire process of production, distribution and discarding. Another noteworthy announcement was its all-electric commercial vehicle, Ionic 5-based robo-taxi. When it comes into use in 2023, the company expects the commercial vehicle to heavily contribute to reducing emissions. Hyundai's motive is in line with the Moon administration's goal of achieving zero carbon emissions by 2050. In South Korea's budget plan for 2022, some 10 billion 400 million U.S. dollars have been set aside to promote the use of eco-friendly cars, fund tree planting projects, and for use with the climate response funds to slash greenhouse gas emissions. And finally tonight, multiple waves of the pandemic have caused a swell of stress and trauma for the frontline healthcare workers for some. The best way to decompress is to catch a different kind of wave. Some healthcare workers in California are relieving their COVID-19 pandemic stress through surfing. First time surfers usually spend most of their time tumbling in the white water. But with each wipe out, these 10 Southern California healthcare workers are washing away pandemic stress. 
the pressure is okay. But Nurse Daniel Shimalevsky so. works 12-hour shifts at Torrance Memorial Hospital. The wipeouts are soon followed by smiles and cheers. <laughs> and before long, these new students are starting to become surfers. Turns out a turbulent ocean can calm the mind. And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.